trust me. No way. Okay, yeah, does that look, does that look okay? Well, you got you got a short one to do. Well, I tell you what, I'll, I'll go under. I'll go under. We'll all, all three of us will go under, and then we can finish early. Because I think I might finish within. Well, actually, I don't know. I think I'll probably take up half an hour. Um, Otto, do you want to mention that, uh, this is invited or not? Because it's kind of invited, isn't it? The, uh, Oh, I won't. Mean, I, mean, I don't have to. Even. Yeah. Okay. You were, you were not invited because you're sitting next to me. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, I wasn't mentioning anything. You don't. You can start late if you want to, actually, and maybe. Because there are people, there are people. If there's anything like the one I came to the other day, people were walking in for like ten minutes. So. What's the competition? I always look at the competition. Sorry. Last TNC, I was, at, was in competition with something like a panel discussion. So there was hardly anybody in the one I was in. <coughs> Mobility, advanced applications. These people will probably look at this and go, Federica.
keep you. Yes, you would look at stress. There'll be loads of people coming in for ages. So. All right, uh, good afternoon everybody. Uh, we are good to start uh, this session. My name is Otto Kreiter and I will chair this, uh, the 100G session. And our first talk will be about uh, the Giant Network and the plans on how to roll out 100G in the Giant Network. And I would like to invite uh, to the podium Michael Enrico, who is the network engineering and planning manager in Dante. And you can read his nice uh, bio in the, on the website, but I will leave the floor to him. Michael? Uh, thank you very much, Otto. So my name is Michael Enrico. As you can see, I'm the Network Engineering, planning, uh, network engineering and Planning Manager at, uh, at Dante. Um, and I've also been a task leader in the GN3 project um, for the last uh, two years now. Um, and that task um, has been the one in which we've been trying to develop the new architecture um, for, for the, the, new ver the new version of Géant, if you like, the next generation, um, and, leading and, to, and to start to lead into procurement of that. So first of all, can I make um, uh, two apologies? First of all, this session is on 100G, um, and uh, the two speakers after me are going to be talking about real practical examples of using 100G. Um, I'm not. I I'm going to talk about uh, our preparations for, for planning to deploy it in the network with a particular emphasis um, on tr transmission. Um, and my, my second uh, apology um, is that uh, some of you may know we're in a, we in Dante are in a rather complex procurement at the moment. In fact, we've just started it. Um, and, and, and it's for trans transmission and switching equipment. Um, and hence, this presentation uh, cannot, it will not be uh, quite as interesting as you'd probably like it to be. However, I'll do my best to, to try and entertain you for the next uh, 25 minutes or so. So here's my agenda. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick reminder about Géant today. Um, then I'll talk about all the service requirements that we've been um, talking about for the last uh, year or two uh, within the Géant project. Um, and some of the architectural deliberations that have been going on. Um, <coughs> finally, I shall tell you uh, where we are with the procurement activity. Um, and then uh, take some questions at the end. Okay, so a quick reminder who Dante are. Uh, so Dante uh, is a non-profit making company which is uh, owned by the European NRENS. Uh, we supply them with a backbone network currently called the Géant Network. Um, so Dante was established in about 1993. We're currently about 60 employees are based in Cambridge. Um, our turnover is about 40 million euros a year. Um, what is Géon? So Géon is a number of things. Um, it's a project. It's a, uh, a consortium of NRENs. It's a service area. Um, but particularly, it's also a backbone network. So that's what I'll be talking about um, when I think when I discuss th the plans that we've been we're trying to make now for uh, rolling out 100G on that network. Um, as I mentioned already, actually, that there are a number of, um, of uh, activities within the Géon project, and um, so. Amongst those activities, there are various research activities and service activities. And amongst those, I will concentrate on, on what are called tasks one and two in service activity one. So task one relates to uh, the development of architecture and task two to procurement. So a quick reminder 
of the Geant network today. So, as you all know, local campus networks connect to the national research networks, and then the national research networks are connected together by the Geant backbone. Uh, the network as it is today offers speeds up to 40 gigabits per second, so two of the trunks on the network uh, run at 40 gigabits per second. Uh, that's two of the IP trunks. Um, the network itself is about 50,000 root kilometers, um, of which about 12,000 kilometers is now based on owned and, and managed lit fiber. The 25 points of presence, um, and there are three main service types that we offer, um, which many in the research and education community will be familiar with. We call these uh, Geant IP, which is our, our long-standing IP service, Geant Plus, which is a, a sub-wavelength circuit switched service, um, and Geant Lambda, which is essentially just uh, access to the transmission layer for the provision of point-to-point -point wavelengths. So that is summarized here. Um, access to the IP network is at up to 20 gigs at the moment. Um, all those uh, long-standing services like native multicast, V6, quality of service have been um, on that network for a long time now and used quite successfully. The Geon Plus service is the uh, sub-wavelength point-to-point uh, -point service. So this provides connectivity between NRENs and uh, between, N between pairs of NRENs, between uh, NRENs and light path exchanges and internet exchanges and to transatlantic endpoints. Uh, currently, that um, infrastructure is based on, is based on TDM uh, with a granularity of 155 megabits per second. So that's a VC4 in SDH speak. Um, but the access to that service comes in 10 gigabit chunks. And by and large, most NRENs access it via 10 gigabit Ethernet LAN fi interfaces. And the Jant Lambda service is just access to the wavelength platform. Um, so wh what is on offer at the moment is unprotected uh, 10 gigabit wavelengths connecting to NRENs. So it's just access to direct access to the transponder client. Uh, most users these days are using 10 gigabit Ethernet LAN fi wavelengths. Um, there were quite a few STM64s in the beginning, um, but that is now decreasing in popularity. Um, and there are, f there are diverse <coughs> options for, for both the Geon Plus um, and, the, and the, the Lambda service, which just means that if someone orders a service then, and, the, and there's an existing service they want it to be diverse to, then we have the option of, of routing it di uh, physically diversely. So there's a quick diagram um, showing how uh, two typical POPs are connected together. So here's a, a chain of amplifiers. Here's the WDM system. I, each POP, ma most, many POPs have an IP router, and here's the TDM switch uh, next to it. Um, so, so IP services to the IP um, services accessed via the router. Geon Plus services accessed by the switch. And the Geon Lambda service straight onto the WDM system. Uh, here's a quick um, dissection of the, 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 the current layered architecture, and I've, I've also got in here the, the POP types as well. So at the bottom, there's the fiber, um, which that's the, this is the 12,000 kilometers of fiber uh, that we lease, um, uh, uh, that we, and here are the, the lease circuits where we don't have fiber. Um, sitting on top of that is the WDM network we operate. This is currently an Alcatel Lucent platform, the uh, 1626 Light Manager. Uh, and sat on top of that is the uh, the SDH platform, which again, that's an Alcatel product. Sat on top of that is the router platform, which is consisting of um, Juniper boxes, mainly uh, T640s and T1600s. And now if we look at the different uh, types of, uh, of, of Geon POP, um, so these are the, 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 the POPs in each of the countries that serve the local national research and education networks, then they can be classified as ones that are fully featured, which have uh, um, access to the WDM layer, to the, to, the, uh, to the circuit switching layer, and have an IP router in them, so they're listed there. Um, then there are some which are considered to be routerless, because we don't have a Geant router in those locations, but they have access to all the other services and the other platforms. Um, there are a couple of POPs there uh, which are off the fiber net, but nevertheless they have access to the, to the, to the, uh, uh, to the um, Geant Plus service and to the IP service. Uh, then there are a set of POPs which, uh, which are not off the fiber cloud and they don't have access to the, to the, um, the Geon Plus platform, but they do have access to the, the Geon IP service. And then there are a few POPs here which actually aren't Geon POPs at all. Uh, they are NREN POPs that are connected uh, diversely uh, to the nearest Geon POP. And there's a couple, uh, a few more POPs there that fit into that category there um, where they are, they are they're essentially, there are no routers there, but they do have a local um, Cross connect so they can access the Geon Plus service. Uh, so, with regards to developing the architecture to date, uh, 
Over the last year and a half or so, there have been many deliberations uh, within the project. Um, we've had five architecture workshops uh, sp spanning between uh, these dates here. Um, we, last year, we conducted an RFI exercise, a request for information from equipment suppliers. There's been various pieces of um, analysis done amongst a number of tasks. Um, and then there's been a lot of discussion with, uh, with a committee, a supervisory committee within the project, which is um, supervising the, the generation of this architecture and, and will supervise uh, procurement. So the service aspirations here are to essentially enhance the old. Um, so how much should we raise the service level agreement or the service level specification bar um, and bring in the new, um, so expanding the Géant service portfolio. Um, so a lot of the work's been looking at, I shall, I shall look briefly at, um, at the, the, the conclusions that came out of that. Uh, there has been um, some study of the infrastructure with a, with a view to optimising that. And I'll give you one example, there are very many examples, but I'm just going to give you one today. Uh, so this includes uh, the notion of looking at topological modifications, um, introducing what we call additional access points into the network. So currently today, there's one pop in a country normally, and this is the notion of, of uh, utilising the fact that the fibre runs through some other cities that may be of interest uh, for the, for the local end to access the network at that point, um, and then looking at um, some of the discussions around technological upgrades. There's also been discussion about resource sharing, uh, notably um, in, the, in the use of NREN-owned uh, cross-border fibre uh, for the purpose of providing some of the, back, some of the backbone connectivity. And all of this is, is, is summarised in, in a rather weighty Géant deliverable, uh, which has uh, uh, the code there. I've not written the title, but it's something like Final Géant Architecture, and that can be found on the Géant website. So with regards to the service aspirations, uh, the Géant IP service is more or less going to stay the same as it is. It doesn't need a great deal more uh, optimization. Um, we don't think, in, at least in the short term. Uh, but the services that will be um, considered for enhancement uh, as, as we move forwards uh, are the Géant Plus service and the Géant Lambda service, so I'll concentrate on those two now. So uh, one of the things that's been, been uh, discussed is to, is to access that service with higher capacity interfaces. Um, to offer uh, recovery uh, for for point-to-point -point circuits. So currently, I, mean, I didn't mention earlier on, but those circuits are unprotected. Um, and then the notion of, of, of providing much more rapid and on-demand provisioning of those services, um, building it on a on a fundamentally uh, packet-based architect uh, network so that it can allow statistical multiplexing as and when it as and when people want that. Um, support flows greater than 10 gigabits per second. Um, and this is a new one as well. Um, we, we, to add point to multi point uh, and ELAN, um, so multi point to multi point service capability. For the Giant Lambda service, the obvious uh, uh, enhancement that's, that's considered is to uh, provide uh, 40 gigabit and 100 gigabit lambdas um, as production services. And, uh, and then other ideas that have been, have been considered here are, are, are thinking about whether we can provision those much more rapidly um, and uh, using some of the technology available uh, that's been discussed during the course of this conference like Rodem's um, tunable, uh, tunable transponders and various other um, enhancements uh, that WDM systems have, have, have found over the last few years. And then again, the notion of, doing, um, of providing a, a recovery for that as well. So a so giant lambda service that can recover um, uh, maybe based on a mesh-based protection scheme. And there's another service as well, uh, which, is, um, which is what we call advanced photonic services. And this is quite a hot topic at the moment. So this is, there are some, some parts of the, of the NREN community who are very interested in this. Um, it's more than just support for alien waves, um, which if you believe some of the, the contributions we've had today is becoming uh, or will become the norm. Um, so I define here alien waves as, uh, as the injection of um, signals from third-party coloured optics, um, usually based on, on the ITU grid. Um, but those alien waves are amplified, um, dispersion compensated, and I'll come back to that point in a minute, that's why I've underlined it. And maybe they're even gain, maybe they're even gain equalised along with the rest of the channel load. Um, but more than that, um, there are some suggestions that some, some, some other advanced photonic services can be considered. Um, which you might call alien bands. And so this is um, third-party signals that, uh, that occupy more than a, a 50 gigahertz chunk of spectrum on the ITU grid. 
Um, but again, these would be amplified by the existing amplifiers. And then there's another uh, notion that we have a, a service which is, which is one where, again, a chunk of bandwidth um, is, is transported, but then it's amplified uh, separately. And, and in particular, uh, there, are, there are a group of um, the, 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 the um, frequency metrology community uh, are interested in exploring um, this, whether or not they can, they can make use of this uh, over, the, over the backbone network between countries. Um, so we still have some investigations really to do to see whether or not we can effect cost effectively support that. So a lot of these things are all about the notion of fiber sharing. Um, this is not a given yet. Um, what we're doing is, is um, as part of the uh, as part of the um, uh, uh, the procurement that's going on at the moment is we're we're finding out how practical these various services are, whether they can be whether they're affordable and whether they can be managed effectively. So that was the, the service aspirations for the new network. Um, here's an example of one of the optimizations uh, that, I was, that I mentioned, the infrastructure optimizations. So many people are familiar with this tube map rep representation of the Jelm backbone. If we focus on, um, on the area around Geneva, for example, it looks like we have four diverse links into Geneva. These black lines here uh, are all the fiber links in the network, the dark fiber-based links. But when you look at it, close up, you find that there is not necessarily as much diversity there as you think. Um, it's difficult to see on this map, I'm afraid, because the, the lines are sort of alternating red and yellow. Uh, but the reality is here's Geneva, and here's the, 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 the two fiber lines, so one of them going towards, um, towards Frankfurt, one going towards, um, towards Milan, coming up here out of Geneva, and then they split near Basel. And there's another example here. This is the, the lines going towards Paris and Madrid come out of uh, Geneva, come down toward, they split at Lyon, so they're commonly rooted between here and here. And we, we didn't enter into this uh, blind, by the way. We knew this when we, when we bought the fiber. At the time, there wasn't a great deal of choice. Um, so, of course, what we can now consider with, uh, with, uh, with, um, with the advent of rodents and, and them being affordable is we can consider to, to, make a, to, make a, to put a couple of rodents in, for example, one in Lyon, one in Basel. Um, and that allows us to do things like this. So currently, if a wavelength is coming from Frankfurt through into Geneva, it comes this way. If we, if we provide a wavelength service between Frankfurt and Milan, it'll come into Geneva, get regenerated, and come back out again. Fundamentally, this is a point-to-point -point network at the moment, by the way. There are no rodents um, in the network today. Um, but of course, if we have a rodent here, we can, um, we can hopefully route services straight through the rodent in, um, in, uh, in Basel. Um, and in fact, we have a number of options as to what we do with this link here. We could actually abandon one of the fiber pairs and maybe use that for experimental purposes or keep it in place, make this a four-way rodent um, and keep the two lines there. So there's a number of options there. So this is just one example of, of a topological modification, if you like, that can be made to the network. There are many others, actually. There are a number of other sites like this. Um, so now on to the, the technological considerations, and this is mainly focused on thinking about how we might deploy 100 gigabit on this network. So as a quick reminder of the situation today with regards to the, to the, the way the, um, the, the uh, transmission network is built, as I said before, there are 12,000 kilometers of fiber. Uh, that's a mixture of G655, most of it Corning Leaf, and 652, or single mode fiber. Um, some of, the, some, of the, some of the spans are quite long, and um, some of the routes between pops are quite long. I have a, a little a slide in a minute that will show you that. As I said before, it's just about all point to point. So there are a couple of OADMs, fixed OADMs in the network, one in Brussels um, uh, and one in Barcelona. The system was originally designed for up to 40 channels in the 50 gigahertz grid. Um, but in actual fact, some of the links uh, have had to be run at 100 gigahertz spacing at least for the first 20 channels, uh, because those are the 655 links and otherwise non-linear effects uh, would have affected uh, the performance of those, those channels. In actual fact, um, that may not have been completely true. Uh, that might have just been conservative planning, because uh, in, uh, on quite a few locations, when, the, when new wavelengths have been installed, they have not necessarily been installed with 100 gigahertz spacing, and they still seem to work just fine. Um, and the highest channel count um, on the network is around about 18 wavelengths. Uh, this is between Frankfurt um, and Geneva, unsurprisingly. 
Uh, so here's a quick histogram of some of the, f the root lengths. So roots are between a pop to pop. Um, most of them are between 400 and 800 kilometers in length. Um, and here's a histogram of, of the span length. So these are between huts. Um, and so most of them are here around about the 80 kilometer mark, 80 or 90 kilometer mark. There's a few here, as you can see, uh, over 100 kilometers. So, so what we started to do, um, as I said before, we, we, we conducted an RFI exercise last year, and we really wanted to understand how practical and how affordable is it for us to deploy uh, 100 gigabit uh, wavelengths on this infrastructure. So this is a, a, a representative diagram here, which I'll try and explain some of the um, some, some of the what we've we've been considering over the, uh, for, for over the last year or so. Um, how about reach? Reach is king, of course. Everybody talks about reach with, uh, one, with coherent 100 gigabit wavelengths. And um, so we asked all of the suppliers who contributed in our RFI exercise to, to determine how, how it worked on our network. So we gave, them the fi we gave them the fiber data. We didn't give them all of the data. We gave them a subset of the, of the fiber network data. Um, and we found uh, that for some of them, uh, they, couldn't even, they couldn't even get uh, from, uh, from one pop to a neighboring pop in, this, uh, in, in the circumstance where we have uh, an amplifier uh, with dispersion compensation in it still. So these are the, if you like, these could be considered to be the same kind of amplifiers as we have in the network today. As I said before, it's dispersion compensated. Um, so that's, okay, that's not good news if we can't get from one pop to another. Um, we can if we then regenerate that halfway down. So, so some of the solutions we saw uh, included putting uh, a essentially putting an, amp uh, um, an, an optical ad drop mux halfway along it so that we could drop out 100 G channels, uh, regenerate them, and send them on their way. So that's okay, that's fine. Uh, the 100 gigabit channel can go between two of our, our, more, our more distant pops. Um, however, uh, the, the, money, the money people might not be quite so happy because now we've got four transponders, four expensive transponders instead of two to provide the service. Um, and how does it work with, with, with 10 gigabit lambdas in there as well? Because the 10 gigabit lambdas won't go away for the time being. So, no problem. It's uh, dispersion compensated. Uh, in f these amplifiers have got dispersion compensation in them, so, so they should get through just fine as they do today. Um, so our, our user of a 10 gigabit wavelength is happy. Um, and our user of a potential alien wavelength is happy as well. Okay. Um, there's been some discussion about guard bands as well. Do we need them? Um, and uh, I understand uh, at the optical event in Cannes a few weeks ago, that was also a hot discussion. Um, from our experience, if we did have to use guard bands and we used them in an environment where we had fixed filters, then we may well find, apart from there being inefficient use of spectrum, there's also inefficient use of filter ports and therefore inefficient use of shelves and inefficient use of space. Um, but we have, mixed, we have mixed them responses, actually, when we asked the question about using guard bands in this scenario where we're mixing 10 gigabit and 100 gigabit transmission. All right, so um, as I said before, we wanted to try and get to the, we wanted to understand uh, this reach thing a bit more. So, so we, we um, in part of the RFI, we sent a reference network diagram uh, to the to the companies that uh, engaged in the RFI exercise, and th and this is as is shown on this diagram here. So this is real fiber data. This is our Western Ring. Um, so it consists of uh, this is all 655 fiber around this ring here. Two long 652 spurs uh, to Copenhagen. Uh, we asked them to apply um, a full mesh of uh, of 10 gig services of, of 40 and 100, and then combinations of these. Um, so th by asking them to do a full mesh, of course, we have, so we have something like 60, uh, 17 uh, traffic relationships if they do a full mesh. Uh, it, uh, we, uh, we actually asked them to leave out Brussels, by the way, um, in that full mesh. Um, so it's, slightly, it's not quite a full mesh. And, um, and then the transmission paths range from 300 kilometers uh, to 2,600 kilometers. And if you think about the next shortest, the next, uh, the shortest diverse path, uh, then the path lengths went up to, uh, to, to 3,450 kilometers. Um, so, so we, th we then looked at some of the results that came back, and uh, let me try and explain these here. Uh, so, so it's a nice idea to go, because this is all really addressing the question, should we go all coherent? 
Um, and it's a nice idea if the reach benefits um, justify the extra cost. Uh, so what are those costs? Well, they're those costs are of upgrading the photonic layer, um, uh, as I'll show you in a minute, possibly taking out uh, the amplifiers with dispersion compensation in them and replacing them with single-stage uh, amplifiers optimised for a coherent scheme, uh, one without dispersion compensation, and of course disposing of the legacy of uh, 10 gigabit transponders that we have in there today. And um, so what we did was, we, if, what we, on, in, in, this, in these graphs here are the uh, total number of regenerators needed to, to, to do the full mesh um, across that network I just showed you there in, under certain circumstances. So this is when the dispersion compensation modules remain in the network and the fibre type remains, as you saw in that diagram, mainly 655 and two routes at 652. Um, so to, in order to, to, to fulfil that, that full mesh, uh, this is the number of regens that are needed. So the blue, the blue line, uh, the blue bar is for 40 gigabit coherent and the red, red one for 100 gigabit coherent. Um, so this was one particular vendor. Um, and then they did the, repeated the exercise uh, and they, they essentially took out the, the dispersion compensation, but they still retained the mixed fibre base. Uh, and then they repeated it again with, uh, again, no dispersion compensation, um, but um, with, uh, an, with SMF only. So we took, essentially, we, we hypothetically replaced the G655 with the G652, and it made some big differences here. Um, but this is one vendor. Some other vendors didn't seem to see much difference at all. So we never, so we, were try to, we tried to understand whether or not that was simply because uh, that particular vendor was using more conservative planning rules um, or more conservative modeling than the other vendors. And then what we have here um, is comparing um, two vendors here. So again, this vendor here, um, this, is the, this is the same vendor, vendor X, as in this diagram here. Um, this is the situation where the, there's no dispersion compensation and we're using the mixed fibre base. So we're assuming here that we would change the amplifiers but not change any of the fibre. Um, and so we compare here one vendor uh, with another vendor, and there's a big difference. So like I said, maybe, maybe they were using vastly different um, uh, assumptions in their modelling, or maybe one has a, a vastly better transponder than the other. In actual fact, um, what I can tell you, of course, is that when we've started to look at these same figures now, this was last year, bear in mind, when we start to look at the same figures now, uh, these have all changed quite a lot. So uh, this, for example, has come, come down. Um, and in this case here, there were, there were, this was two examples. So this, this, this large red line here, which is, this was vendor Y uh, with, their, with their, first, uh, their first offering. And then when they, they had a second version of their 100 gigabit coherent transponder, and that improved things greatly. So there's a few obvious points to make here. Um, going for an all coherent, um, an all -coherent scheme is, is obviously easier for a greenfield rollout. Um, one problem is that there's no discrete 10 gigabit coherent that's going to work there. So I'll, I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, obviously, 40 uh, mux bonders, 4 times 10 or 10 by 10 uh, mux bonders um, can, can work here. But then your traffic matrix, your traffic requirement needs to be commensurate with that. And then the other question is, how do alien waves uh, fit into this? So in pictures, um, now I consider a situation where we have uh, Amplifiers without dispersion compensation here. So this is now going for the, co the 100 gigabit uh, coherent um, optimized Jean backbone. So this time round, hopefully uh, all the 100, the 100 gigabit wavelengths will get from one pop to the neighboring pop quite easily. So our users happy. Um, and the, and if the, long, the reach is sufficient, and it looks like it is, we should even be able to get from, from one pop uh, to more or less to, to, a, to a much more distant pop in the network, and this is good for when we uh, if and when we start to receive orders for wavelengths which are which are going from one side of the network to the other. But um, so the user's happy there. Um, but in order to achieve that, of course, we want to make sure that this is no longer a point-to-point -point network, but that we've installed some some uh, some wavelength selective switching um, at all the nodes so that this, this uh, cost saving can be realized. This wavelength can be implemented with just two transponders uh, as opposed to four. Um, okay, there might be some extra cost involved in installing all of these rodents in the sites, um, but the user's happy. Uh, but now 
there's the notion um, of the 10 gigabit um, uh, wavelength. So if we have, a st as, w as was called earlier on, the Morse wavelength, so this is a simple on-off keyed wavelength, uh, 10 gigabit uh, wavelength, um, <coughs> then it's simply not going to work here because the dispersion is much, because the dispersion is no longer compensated. Of course, there are answers, there are solutions based um, on 10 gigabit wavelengths with electronic dispersion compensation, so they can be considered. Um, but one assumes that they're more costly than the former. So again, they're happy. Um, but what about the alien waves I talked about before? So this is now inserting an alien wave into the network. And if that u the user of the alien wave, the person who wants to insert it, uh, wants to do that with a, a simple on-off keyed wavelength, then they're going to have a problem, aren't they? Because this is a, a dis non-dispersion compensated network. So their reach will not get them where they probably want to go. As I mentioned before, um, to support 10 gigabit services, uh, 4 by 10, uh, 4 by 4 or 10 by MUX bonders uh, may be helpful. However, don't forget now we have four 10 gig services or 10 10 gig services all going to this location here. Uh, this is a this is a rodem here as a wavelength selective switch, so all four channels are being switched at the same time. So uh, I have a user who wants to drop. Here, he can't do that at the moment, so then I have to have some electrical processing in that node anyway in order to enable him, enable him to do that if I'm going to cost effectively and efficiently use the capacity in these MUX bonders. So that's what's being considered um, uh, with regards to supporting 100 gigabit services in, in, the, in the Geant backbone. Um, and I have three summary slides here now. Um, so that's the situation when we, when we enter our procurement. Essentially, uh, we, we, I can say that not all requirements and or technological preferences are, are absolutely clear at, at the point of commencing procurement. Um, hence, we're using a competitive dialogue procedure for doing the procurement. Um, but what I can say is that a number of firm requirements came out of the architecture work, and those have gone into this procurement, and that is, obviously, we need to be able to support uh, our ongoing existing services. Um, the requ we require to be able to support 100 gigabit wavelength and 40 gigabit wavelengths uh, from day one in this infrastructure. Um, we are going to have we we will we will we want to have Jean Plus service accesses um, and service instances running at greater than, than 10 gigs. And uh, this feature of having point to multi point services in Jean Plus um, is also a firm requirement. So that has in that has dictated um, how we do the procurement um, and and a few a few preferences at the beginning, there are, a few th th there are also a number of these optional nice-to-haves, which are things that are if, if we determine during the dialogue that they're practical and affordable, um, then, maybe we, then we will uh, assume them, otherwise they may not get um, purchased at all. So features to be able to do lambda restoration, um, support for TDM-based uh, sub-lambda point-to-point services, but in the, in, the, um, in the transmission layer this time, not in the, the switching layer. Um, and, and then finally support for advanced, these advanced photonic services that I mentioned earlier. Um, so in summary, the, the procurement has been arranged as follows in three lots. So lot one um, is about the transmission layer. Um, lot two is about the, the, the Geon Plus layer. Um, and this is quite clearly we're, we're acquiring here a, a packet switching a solution so that any remaining TDM switching will stay down now in, lot, in, the, in the lot one layer. And then we also allowed the option for, for, for a, thir a third lot, which is essentially a converged uh, solution for these, for these two lots. Um, some people might say this is looking for the God box, um, but uh, it's, it, also, it doesn't just allow for converged platforms, but also for integrated solutions. So there may be two vendors or two different products from the same vendor, which the supplier has integrated in terms of management sufficiently that we're happy uh, with that as, as a lot three offer. Um, and finally, this is where we are with the procurement. Again, I can't say anything more than this than, than, uh, than we've started this at the beginning of the year. Um, we are here. We are at this stage where we have got our initial responses to a descriptive document in the competitive dialogue and we read, th we read through a group of people read through those in Cambridge uh, last week, in actual fact. So clarifications will be sought um, this week and then first supply meetings uh, in June. Um, then we plan, having, having determined from that um, what's possible, then we will uh, update our descriptive document, um, re reissue that uh, after we've taken some, some, some final uh, serious technology decisions 
and then we expect to conclude uh, the, the, the dialogue phase uh, and issue a tender uh, around about the end of this year and then hope to select and sign around about March next year um, and finally to complete the rollout um, towards the end of uh, uh, but, uh, with towards the end of 2012 or maybe into early 2013. So that's all I have to say um, and I'll take a few questions. Thank you Michael. Uh, I think this also works. Any question from the audience? Um, one of them is LHC1. <laughs> but I'm told by those that are involved in that that uh, they, think they consider there to be, uh, that to be an example of, um, a, of a service that would be used by other communities. So to some extent, there is, that's the only true business case at the moment, but they, people figure that there will be others in the future. As I as I have understood your your procurement, uh, uh, no the other way around. Usually, uh, if one is going up from a current uh, pl uh, optical platform to a future optical platform, many or most of the entrants uh, are interested to uh, take 10 gigabit and let's say 100 gigabit in parallel on the same fiber. So. Uh, if I understood you correctly, you are thinking or, or one of the possibility have been that an uh, offer of a company could also include the multiplexing of many 10 gigabit uh, uh, channels into a 140 or 100 gigabit channel right, yeah. going via one fiber. So you could use uh, on such a fiber, uh, you could uh, um, must not uh, need, you ha don't need uh, compensation features and you can have the same uh, uh, coherent transponders or similar transponders at the end. That was your yeah, idea. Yeah. But I mean if you collect, uh, if I s look on the European map, if you collect all these, uh, many of the 10 gigabit channels into a bundle of 10, it, it's a point of failure. Very. Uh there is a, there, there's, the, there's the element of a point of failure, right? Yes, I didn't mention that. Um, but, but but also there's the there's the economics of it all as well. So um, if the if the, me if the traffic matrix is not commensurate with with using that, then it doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. So so we, we, we we're still looking at, at both scenarios, R running the hundred gigabit uh, wavelengths over the dispersion compensated network, so we can still run discrete ten gigs cost effectively. It really depends when we think we will get orders for long distance, say one hundred gigabit wavelength services, because if, because if we if we design it so that they don't span those long distances and we have to regenerate them, then they get more costly later on. Any other question? This is the last question. We have to cut it short. I, as I understood, you are going to, uh, in order to make it your, your Northern network 100 gig enabled, you are going to make it DCM free. That's an option. That hasn't, that hasn't quite yet been decided. Okay, because in that case, what are you going to do with 10G transponders, which you already uh, invested? Uh, so. You so you put a lot of yeah, money on that. That's so right, is, indeed. Yeah, that's the difficulty, and that's why I mentioned that the, the the lot one is actually for the lot one requirement is for upgrade or replacement. So that hasn't yet been be determined. Um, <coughs> yeah, Klaus Grohe from Matfa Optical Networking. One question: um, uh, How far is it considered that after 100 gig they'll come 400 gig, or maybe 500 or one tera, etc.? So, so, in other words, if you don't switch now, you have to switch later. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. my, my fear yeah. is uh, the sooner you switch, the, the less pain it is. Yeah, absolutely. Is that yeah. a, a consideration? It is a consideration. So, so the, one of the requirements into the, in, the, uh, in the descriptive document was that solutions should preferably not um, block, uh, should not block the move to higher capacity wavelengths in the future. Uh, thanks everybody for the good discussion and I wish a lot of good luck to my <laughs> friend Michael because I know how complex is such a procurement and uh, he will need a, bit, a lot of luck and <laughs> good luck.
Uh, next uh, talk will be from uh, Rob Evan Evans from Janet, and he will talk about practical experiences about uh, we doing it with uh, 100G in the Janet network. Let's welcome uh, Rob, and uh, let's hear what Janet is up to. Thanks, Otto. Right, so as uh, Otto introduced me, uh, I'm Rob Evans, I'm a Chief Technical Advisor for Janet UK. The title of the talk is Extending the Life of A Network by 40%. The A here is obviously our network, uh, this is what we chose to do. Uh, what you might need to do will obviously vary. So a bit of background as to why we had to make the network last a bit longer. Super Janet 5 entered service in 2006. It had a five-year lifespan. Um, it was due to be replaced this year, 2011. But given the economic climate, elections in the UK going from left-wing governments to right-wing governments, uh, fun general funding uncertainty through our funding bodies, we took the, the original contract was for five years, but with a potential two-year extension. So we decided that we were going to have to exercise that extension. And as part of exercising that extension, we had to make sure that the backbone that we'd expected to be thrown away and replacing would last for a uh, couple more years. So at that point, this is what we had. Um, the backbone of Janet uh, has a c core points of presence uh, around the country. So we have Glasgow up in Scotland, uh, Manchester, Leeds in the north of England, Reading and London in the south of England, Bristol in the southwest, and then London Telly House and London Telly City. These are in the Docklands area of London, and it's where the majority of the country's external interconnection happens. It's where uh, the big points of presence are, where e everyone's present. Sites, universities, our customers connect to regional networks, which aren't shown on that diagram. Uh, the regional networks are sometimes autonomously managed, they're sometimes managed by us, and they connect to, to two of those uh, backbone points of presence. And as mentioned, yeah, most of the external connectivity comes into those places in London. So this is the ob uh, obligatory graph that goes up and to the right. Every presentation must have one. Um, the lower down circle is from uh, 2009. That's when we upgraded from uh, 10 gigs to 40 gigs. This shows the sorry. Th this shows the uh, overall level of traffic coming into Janet. So that that, that bottom cir circle there shows the traffic levels of about 35 gig, which is when we upgraded from multiple 10 gigs to 40 gig. And that circle at the top right is where we are now. So during a heavy media event, we can expect to be pulling in close to 90 gigabits per second of traffic. That's not capacity, it's 90 gigabits per second of traffic coming into Janet. So it's obvious that 40 wasn't enough. Um, we need to do something to go beyond that. We need something that's going to last us at least the extra two years of the Janet backbone. And given the current uh, rate of expansion, that probably means peaks of at least 200 gig a second of the external traffic. We also want to do a few other things. Uh, as I mentioned, every, all of the external traffic comes into London's Docklands, uh, London Tele City, London Tele House. So we want to reduce the reliance on that. It's something, what happens if there's a major exclusion event in London? Uh, uh, so we're building a pop further up north, which hasn't been feasible up, up until now for major uh, interconnection because all of the ISPs, as I mentioned, are in the London Docklands area. So only recently they've been starting to build out significant capacity elsewhere. We've been helping setting up uh, some a new internet exchange point in the north of the country and, and had the benefit of removing our reliance on London Docklands is that it, it also reduces the amount of north-south traffic. We still need the bandwidth because we need to cope if any single pop fails, and the bandwidth is, is only going to go up. So we still need some more capacity. So what were the options of that? Well, we could bundle up more 40 gig. Um, we've got uh, a reasonable investment of STM256 circuits, but SDH is dead. I mean, you know it, I know it. SDH is dead. 
So we can't really um, justify more expense in 40 gig interfaces. They'd have to be written off over a fairly short life. We could build a meshier network. Now that would be complicated. Uh, you know, having more shortcuts just through things at the optical le le level uh, straight to the network. That would be complicated because when we built the network in 2006, it was based on Sienna core streams all across the network. To get the 40 gigs on the north-south links, which have some pretty bad PMD, uh, we had to install Sienna, uh, no, as they were then, Nortel 6500s on top of them. So there ends up being lots of point-to-point -point links. You end up having to, to build a mesh network, you end up having to regenerate, uh, or at least you just got air gaps you need to bridge. There's a mesh network means that your capacity planning is a lot more complicated. Uh, you need to figure out exactly where the traffic flows. You have to know where the traffic flows are and be able to you know, be sure you know where they're going to go in any particular link failure. And as I mentioned, who wants to put more money into STM256s? So the other option then was to just bin them. Why don't we bin the 40 gigs uh, uh, and go with the 10 gigs? Well, as I say, we, you know, we, um, we did put a fairly hefty investment into uh, 40, into, uh, uh, 40 gig interfaces. Uh, when they were delivered, they were delivered to a, a van that couldn't stop outside our building. It stopped a bit down the road. And I was carrying, you know, pushing a little trolley with the 40 gig interfaces up the road and calculated how much they were worth and kind of then asked for a bit more help. <laughs> So, in summary, we didn't want to write off what we'd already paid for 40 gig, but we didn't want to buy any more either. So, the solution was to possibly migrate the existing 40 gigs into bundles, and then deploy multiple 10 gigs or something else, I wonder what that might be, uh, elsewhere in the network. Now, up until now, that something else has been one option. It's been lots and lots of 10 gigs in parallel. And we'd done, but we'd, uh, but we'd already done some 100 gig groundwork. We'd done some transmission side tests with Sienna and not Sienna. Um, and the PMD tolerance was, you know, pretty good. Uh, it certainly was easier to get 100 gigs going than it had been to get the 40 gigs going. We'd had a, had a, a test with 100 odd kilometers of fiber, the 6500 at each end with neighboring 40 gig, 100 gig, and 10 gig channels with a PMD emulator, crank the PMD emulator up first, and as you've heard several times this week already, uh, because of the on-off keying, the, uh, the 10 gig failed first, then the 40 gig, and the 100 gig was just happily carrying on with a uh, simulated PMD of uh, 40 or more picoseconds. So that was the transmission side. We'd tried to test the Juniper interface as uh, Michael, you're uh, slightly aware. <laughs> but uh, we had similar problems on both sides of this, so it required beta software on the routers, and neither of our ops departments were really going to fall for it. So, uh, yeah, so we, we, we didn't actually test the, the client side of it, but we had done quite a bit of 100 gig groundwork on the transmission side. Now, why would you want to go 100 giggy? Well, or why do we want to go 100 giggy, I should say? Um, well, first of all, try to avoid, try, we're trying to avoid big bundles of lots and lots of 10 gigs. If you're doing a bundle for capacity, then you, know, you might well have to take a bundle of 10 or more 10 gig interfaces down if just one interface fails. So on a 10 by 10 bundle, that's 20 single points of failure. And if you're not going to take it down, you need to be able to do some complex some traffic engineering to shift LSPs around. I don't like complicated. I'm a simple person. I can understand simple. And, oh, well, we don't want MPLST in the back one either, so that kind of shoots that out of the water. But why might you not want to do 100 giggy? It's a large chunk of bandwidth and chassis space. If you want to add another 10 gig and in incrementally increase onto your uh, uh, a bundle, but you're using T1600s, add, adding another 10 gig is just 1 64th of your chassis capacity gone. If you want to bundle up a second 100 gig E into your uh, in, 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 into a bundle, then that's an eighth of your chassis space gone. So it's a large quantum. It's you know, if you want to increase, it, it's a, a lot of chassis space. Uh, it's expensive. There's no way to doubt that it is expensive, and there's the risk. It's, it's still a new technology. There isn't much 100 gig in live in in the world. 
But we decided we'd uh, take the risk anyway. Uh, we were, I don't know, why not? Um, it w and we had some good deals while then, which meant it wasn't, uh, it wasn't necessarily that expensive, uh, certainly compared to scaling up um, SCN 256s. So this is what we, uh, we, we, we planned the new side of the network to be. Doubling up links to Glasgow and Bristol, adding that new mattress at Tele City pop in for the external interconnection, and then these four, this mesh of 100 gig circuits from the Docklands points of presence into Reading and London. Now, that's actually a single fiber span that goes Reading, uh, goes a long way around. Reading, London Tele City, London Tele House, London UK 5. I'll come back to that in a second. So, you're here. Uh, we're the 100 gig early adopter. Uh, the people that overpay, the people that brag about it, the one that do both the early adopters. And, and bearing in mind when I say this, that my CEO in the uh, Future of Anyone session yesterday said that the race to 100 gig stuff was just not important. But we got a pretty good deal, as I say, especially if the alternative was scaling 40 gig circuits. And I'm trying to share rather than brag. But, you know, he's kind of cool. So this is the obligatory sort of network diagram. As you can see, you know, compared to the fiber spans that Michael was talking about earlier of 600 kilometers, uh, 800 kilometers, our longest span here is 112 kilometers. Then you've got three kilometers and 25 kilometers. This is all in a fairly confined space in the uh, southeast of London. But it did mean, again, deploying Sienna, I've got it right first on this, Sienna 6500s on top of the Sienna core streams. So we have our core routers at the top, the Juniper T1600s. We have Sienna 6500s, uh, then which have the 40 gig client interfaces and the 40 gig trans, uh, 40 gig, 100 gig, 100 gig e client interfaces, 100 gig transponders, which then pump it over the fiber. And we've got four circuits uh, to notable lines on the bottom. So we've got Reading to TeleCity and TeleHouse, and UK5 to TeleCity and TeleHouse. The Sienna core streams, we were, st we were stuck with those. They were the things that had been in since 2006, and it was too much, uh, too much bother to uh, uh, take them out, rip them out really. It would be far too disruptive for the network, and we can't really afford the time it would be involved to disrupt our major external points of interconnections. So we're running the 6500s on top of them. Easy, they're both Sienna, of course, except you know, they're not. And they've got different optical characteristics. The core streams, launch low and have very sensitive, they preamp on the input. 6500, yes, amps its output signal really high uh, and you know, has VOAs on, uh, on, on input. And there's no automatic gain control between the two. You need to tune uh, uh, the receive optical levels. On top of that, the signal to rise on our tiny little 100 kilometer link, you know, bear in mind the uh, stuff that uh, Michael was just saying, we have to increase the signal noise, so we've had to put Raman amps on this 112 kilometer links, 112 kilometer link, which meant a whole bunch of changes, including uh, splicing rather than patching at various places. We had to replace a bunch of SCPC connectors with E2000 APC that have little shutters that when you take it off, you aren't going to get blinded. Uh, and because of these optical mismatches, we had to move some circuits around to create a fairly large guard band. You say that the discussions on the guard band are still far from conclusive. Well, uh, the, uh, the Sienna simulations said, well, let's play it safe. Let's have these uh, fairly large guard bands, which meant moving some of the circuits around. And there's one thing. If we go back to the diagram here, the link from Reading to Teddy House, that goes 112 kilometers and three kilometers. The, uh, the Sienna guys reckoned that we'd have to regen at Teddy City to get to Teddy House. Regen for an extra three kilometers. We kind of asked them a, a little bit about this. Turns out that really this isn't a, this isn't a uh, configuration that they've tested that much and they were being careful. So they agreed to this, you know, try it and then we'll have to back out to regen if, uh, we'd have to back out to regen if uh, it didn't work. So, uh, this is the uh, Juniper interface, they are moving up the stack to the uh, level of the layer three side of things. It's a uh, picture of the Juniper interface, it's got, uh, it's a single FPC4, which has got two 50 gig forging engines in it, which means it's a bit of a special beast. It's got these two 50 gig uh, forging engines. Now, output packets are quite easy, it just kind of takes them, sprays them out. But on the inputs, you need very quickly in a bit of dumb electronics to take 
these packets and spray them over the received uh, uh, PFEs because they can only handle each PFE can only handle 50 gig of incoming packets. So there's a couple of hacks that Juniper has to do this. When you're speaking Juniper to Juniper, it sets the so-called multicast bit on individual flows. Uh, well, not so-called the, the multicast bit on in the MAC address on flows. So that one, some flows will go to one PFE, other flows will go to the other PFE. But that requires the sending equipment to set this bit. So if you have a, another vendor um, talking to the Juniper, the way you have to see them is by using VLANs. You can't have a single 100 gig trunk between your other router and your Juniper. You need to have a bunch of VLANs and then you hash the flows across the VLANs. So that, say every even VLAN goes to one PFE, every odd VLAN goes to the other PFE, and then have multiple IP links across that. And because of the two 50 gig PFEs, it doesn't appear as a single Ethernet interface. It appears as an aggregated Ethernet interface, even though it's for the single 100 gig. That's how it appears. Um, uh, that's the the, uh, the the CFP is the um, which is the optical plugin. It's about the size of a couple of Zen packs, and the client is not unlike the optical side, which I didn't mention is the uh, Nortel uses a single frequency uh, well, sort of uh, bet bet uh, between the, the Nortels. The um, the client side uses always uses a form of WDM. So it, it's a bit invisible to the user, but uh, you have 100 G base LR4, which uses 4 by um, 25 gigabit per second channels, and you also have an option of 100 G base LR10, which uses 10 by 10 channels. I mean, these channels are, as I say, invisible to the user. They don't appear as the channels in an aggregated Ethernet or anything. It's just uh, how the the Mac layer, the file layer, uh, gets the packets from one hop to the next. But it works. After all that, the first two links went into service. Uh, uh, April 12th, second to a month ago, April 19th. Yeah, a couple of minor irritations. Uh, one of the versions of June, the first version of Junos we were using ignored the MTU setting on I ISO packets, which you use for ISIS. That was fixed by a, a minor version upgrade. And it is first generation tech all around. I mean, that's uh, pretty obvious from what I've been saying. Uh, Juniper will get 2 by 100 gig per slot with the T4000. Um, there's going to be improvements on the transmission side too. Certainly on the uh, CNO side, there are uh, second generation cars coming out soon. But it's there, it works. And the rest, well, you know, nowadays for us, building up a second ring of uh, STM256 circuits from London to Leeds to Warrington to Reading to, to carry the double up the packets elsewhere, that was fast. That was actually really fast. It was done in less than a month. So in less time than it took us to decommission the 40 gig cir uh, circuits and shift the interfaces up the country, the optical guys had built and deployed three more 40 gig circuits. So uh, you know, a couple of quick thank yous to uh, Verizon and Sienna, because Verizon managed the optical side of things, we managed the IP side of things, you know, work very closely, Sienna and work also work, work closely with Sienna to make it happen. And there's been lots of folk from both the development and operations sides of, uh, of the company to get going questions, comments, and uh, I think I've got you back on time. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> Any question from the audience? Mm. Excellent. <laughs> I do have one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That uh, uh, the Juniper card. Yeah. Um, I was wondering. Uh, well, I, I I don't know exactly how they uh, distribute uh, the packets across the two packet forwarding engines. Yeah. Are they doing per flow or per it packet? Is per or it, it is per flow. I mean. Uh, okay. So per, yeah. so in theory, yeah. if I were a very demanding user yeah, you, you can't get a with a server, you can't get a flow of more than fifty gigaseconds. So is what you, you can't get, get, that get to. And no, you can't. Okay. Um, if you can generate a flow of more than 50 gigaseconds, well done. I'm speaking of theory, <laughs> but you know, yeah. you know, we have here users, yeah. actually somebody who will talk just after you, yeah. who always managed to generate quite big flows in the Jean network, and <laughs> I'm talking about the next uh, speaker, <laughs> and our operations always crash his head. So. Well, I, I <laughs> bear in mind that the alternative to this is bundling up 10 by 10 gig, in which case your maximum flow is limited to 10 gig. Indeed, indeed. All right, well, it looks very nice. If 
there are no other questions, no, then I would like to invite uh, the next speaker. Thank you, Rob. Uh, the next speaker is Bruno Hoft and actually Robert Stroy from DFN. They will do a tandem presentation and actually Robert will start. Uh, Robert is working for the DFN, for, DFN, for the German uh, uh, NRN, whilst Bruno works for, uh, for KIT, uh, a tier one center in uh, Karlsruhe. Uh, they will talk as well about the field trial of 100G. Okay. So, okay. good evening all together. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to start the presentation together with Bruno. And uh, yes, as Otto said, I'm from DFN and we have set up and coordinated the testbed setup and uh, have done the commissioning of the testbed and I uh, presentate about that. And after that, Bruno will take over and present his his view of the tests and that was has been done okay about the features and goals of the test that we <coughs> we've set up um, we have concentrated on the reality so uh, we, we've used a, a fiber provided by our normal uh, one of our fiber providers that, that we have already in, in XWIN which is Gasline and uh, the fiber length was about 447 kilometers. Uh, the test was not only done on the optical layer, but also we have done interoperability tests between fiber optical transmission system provider, which was another company, Huawei, uh, the router providers, and all the typical end systems provided by uh, Karlsruhe and Jülich systems. Um, at the 100 gig Ethernet interface between the router and UI WDM systems, we have used the, the standardization, standard, standardized interface, which which are uh, the 100 G base LR4 interfaces, and uh, one one of the most important characteristics of the test was a long duration test. We have a test fr had a test window of four weeks where we had to commission all that and then to do the tests. And it was a distributed environment. We had users in Jülich and we had users in Karlsruhe <laughs> and the monitoring has been done by DFN at the NOC. And yes, during the hot, the hot phase of the tests, the goals were First, it's a stress test of the whole system, so bringing the, the full load to the system and see what happens. So fill the 100 gig pipe with IP traffic. Yes, and bring the system into operation, which, which was the first task. And it, worked, it was a bit yes, cumbersome, but it worked at the end. And at the end, we had to verify the stability and get experience from the unforeseen, and we have waited for that, and something happened also. Yeah. Um, here is a sketch of the whole testbed. Um, okay, we see in the center and the middle these, these sites, Jülich in the more northern part of Germany and Karlsruhe more in the southern part of Germany and, and this fiber provided by Gasline. And uh, these, these boxes here are the WDM systems from provided by Huawei and on the fiber path that we had uh, 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 yes, we had we had amplifiers here on the fi on the fiber, six amplifier sites, and so seven segments, fiber segments, uh, and six um, amplifier nodes. So all this uh, optical transmission system was set up by Huawei, and they provided at the client side this 100 GPS LR4 interface where we have connected the Cisco routers. The Cisco routers were CS3 routers, which fabric cards provided 140 gig per slot, and uh, the interfaces were on the, uh, yes, here was a 100 gig interface on, on, the, on the side connected to the Huawei system, and 10 gig Ethernet interfaces, uh, uh, which provided connectivity to the end systems and to the measurement systems which we have set also set up also here. Um, yes, for the for the measurement or for the for testing the quality of the link, 
uh, we have set up here two, two different measurement systems. We have set up first the ADIS system, measuring, measuring the one-way delay, and uh, another measurement system which was used for doing uh, IPERF measurements, so measuring the packet loss on the high, um, on the high data rate. So some words about the methodology that we have used. Uh, the monitoring was done centrally at the DFN. We have used normal SNP monitoring, but with higher granularity. Uh, we have used the CLI commands on the routers, and the output of the routers has been passed. We have stored all the console logs, and we have logged all manual activity so that something is went wrong or so. We had timestamps what happened. Um, <coughs> Active measurements has been done, as already said, with the HATIS boxes, one with LA measurements. Uh, packet loss and packet reordering measurements has been done with uh, IPERF. And also we have tested or checked the availability with a continuous ping between the DFN and systems. And at the end, uh, we have loaded the link with UDP traffic from a special traffic generator, which, was, which has sent traffic into a configured routing loop between the routers over the 100 gig link. And last but not least, IPERF TCP throughput measurements has been done between the end systems at KIT and uh, Jülich. So um, this is more an abstract sketch of the test bed with, with, uh, with the routers here, CS3s in Jülich and Karlsruhe. <coughs> and the measurement systems connected to the routers with single mode interfaces here on the 10 gig Ethernet side. So we see the HADIS system, the IPERF measurement system, and the traffic generator here. And on the other side, also this pair of HADIS and IPERF measurement system. During the commissioning of the test, the first ones were, were to, to configure a routing loop between the routers on the IP level and to, oops, and to inject from the traffic generator here a small amount of data into this routing loop, which was then multiplied by the factor of 127 on this IP link. So, so on the measurement points were the router interfaces which we, which we uh, monitored by SNP and also by the command line interfaces from Cisco. And we have, yes, this is, these are the graphs. The first one is the graph showing the traffic from the traffic injector. You can see here the increasing step was about 100 megabit. And each, this is an IP flow generated with 100 megabit per second. It's run about four hours. <coughs> And some minutes later, the next flow started and so on, up until we've reached this one gigabit speed, which was the interface of the traffic injector. And yes, on the routers, we have first looked on the error counters. And there was, yes, here some, some errors, which we found the reason for. I come later to this. But these errors were very small at the end. It was about. Uh, yes, you see here the absolute numbers and the, the, the ratio from the, from the data traffic to the error traffic was about, was below 10 to the minus 7. So in the data traffic you can see here, yeah. so the monitor traffic on the 100 gig Ethernet interfaces, um, yes, it was as you can see, the, it followed the same pattern as the generated traffic, but it was multiplied by the factor of 127. And we reached the 100 gig Ethernet speed at this time here, when the generated traffic was about 800 megabit per second. So in all other traffic that was here injected further has been discarded or was been discarded in the routers. And at the end, you see on the 100 gig link in the interfaces of the router this quite flat line at about near 100 gig. So this 
these kind of tests mostly finished the, the commissioning phase and the yes an overview about the challenges and experiences we had was um, that the fiber and optical transmission system was established in the real f yeah, in the foreseen time frame so there was no problem seen here um, <coughs> the 100 gig uh, link ethernet link between the Huawei client interfaces was verified using a 100 gig ethernet tester there was no problem no error during a test of 30 hours and when we've connected then the Cisco routers to these client interfaces we had some problems but that has been solved and the problems were that at this time it was last summer in August we had some prototype CFPs you know the, the standardization has been finished during summer last year and the prototype CFPs have been produced some of them beginning of last year and some of them two or three years before so these, CF, these very early C, uh, prototype CFPs had some problems and this was also one what, the reason of the packet errors that we have seen in one interface so but yes at the end uh, new C we had some new CFPs and with that once we had seen no problems so this is uh, the last picture I will present oh, yes you have seen already that this is a typical uh, traffic that we have seen during the at the end of the commissioning phase and at this time we have then put the end systems to the system and uh, Bruno has done or his colleagues has done the further tests so I will take over okay. um, yeah like Robert mentioned the next test what we have done where then the uh, um, tests with real hosts at both ends. We had um, hosts at Jülich. These were hosts of three different types and um, the performance of so those hosts are s slightly different. You will see this in the comic slides during when they had interchanges with the IPO servers at Karlsruhe. It was pretty boring. We had only one type of nodes, nine nodes, which are all the same and um, they performed well what uh, what we should what we have would expected what we would have expected from them um, this is uh, again now the uh, testbed layout ro like Robert showed uh, but a little bit more completed since um, these are the hosts at Karlsruhe these are the hosts at Jülich and between them there are uh, two more boxes each side they were necessary because um, the CSR3 transceiver interfaces are only single mode interfaces and the nodes had only multi multi-mode interfaces and for this purpose we needed a media converter and um, Cisco was supplying for, for this uh, 4900 switch where we could realize the media conversion over um, and uh, with this arrangement we then started uh, in the first um, working out the different nodes, uh, nodes on, uh, on both, both sides that we uh, were looking into um, which node from which side would uh, communicate with, uh, with the other and we were conf um, configuring the TCP sockets since um, at Jülich the hosts were not all at the same time and they needed all special configuration in the TCP sockets and we needed an recording configuration at the Karlsruhe site as well and then we started ramping up the TCP IP IPerf streams the TCP IPerf streams and ramping it down again and this looked like the following this was a graph um, we had there Nine, nine streams. The first three streams are something uh, around 21 gigabyte, uh, or we're filling something around 21 gigabyte. So each stream's approximately seven 
gigabit per second. Then the next five uh, five streams, they are um, have a capacity of close to 10G, and then the ninth stream, the last stream, that did something. Hmm, where we were first a little puzzling what what's happening there. Okay, at the end it t turned out that it has nothing to do with the Hanegi e interfaces. It has n it nothing to do with Hanegi. This was just a, f a faulty ASIC in one of the media converter. And uh, we saw this uh, behavior only in one direction, in flow from Karlsruhe to Jülich. So for further, we avoided this flow. Um, then we said, okay, we have a scene we could fill uh, something around uh, 75 gigabit per second on the stream, uh, but there is still a little bit capacity left. So we uh, then thought, well, we have uh, TCP streams and we have a UDP stream, and we combine those together um, and uh, look what will happen uh, in this case. And um, we saw that. Oops. Come on, there. We saw this. So wha what we expected, there's the nice ramping up. Then we have there a very stable trans uh, transfer. And then uh, comes the UDP, UDP flow, fills up to, to the 100 gigabit of the capacity of the link. Then it's <laughs> ramping down again. The TCP streams are left over. And then this comes down. Um, this so uh, this graph there, this is coming out of the um, UDP uh, uh, IPERF measurement node, which measures the unexpected uh, um, traffic loss, um, because this node can only measure in one direction. So if you would see the graph of the op opposite interface, you would there see then the f the left the uh, this would fill off the spaces. There's so um, this is the f uh, a full graph, and we see there in turn that we have the, the, the TCP streams, and the last stream is now coming fine, and um, the UDP s is ramping up, and then the UDP is uh, pushing down the TCP streams. So this this would be a nice uh, denial of service attack on your service provider, but. Um, this scenario to uh, to uh, um, implement or to configure this environment, uh, you would need to be the service provider. Since uh, normally you have no UDP loop where you can send the packets to and fro over a longer dis uh, over the infrastructure. Um, then we saw that uh, it would still be good to have. Um, um, a, a real TCP streams or fill with TCP streams the whole uh, 100 gigabit uh, interface, uh, and then uh, uh, for this purpose, the um, monitoring node of DFN are reconfigured as uh, TCP sources and destina destinations that we implemented. They're an IPerf server, they're an IPerf server, and they are just taken on uh, with um, TCP streams. And we see that we have this nice graph. Um, there we have the nine streams of between the routers of uh, between the hosts from Karlsruhe to um, um, to Jülich, and these are the two nodes of DFN. And we have their uh, capacity of um, 95.4, 95.5, and we see already that we have their uh, drawback, coming back, uh, behavior, what could uh, point to that this is the end of what you can fill with TCP streams of a 100 gigabit line. But this uh, this is not uh, really certified that it is the, uh, that uh, these 4.4.5G which are there left uh, cannot be filled. For this you would have had another node which we hadn't available. Um, this test there was quite a long, over a quite a long period. This went over 13 hours, 
uh, no over 15 over 15 hours and um, it was pretty stable and uh, like uh, our colleagues from England from Janet uh, they have procu procured already the energy in in their uh, production environment this is what we saw there as well it's uh, pretty close to an environment which can go in production um, now we are coming to the experience what we have obtained during the test and uh, what we saw this is a uh, first step this was gas line they provided the infrastructure for uh, for us and we can certify them um, their fiber infrastructure is ready for 100 GE um, the uh, t total system including the DVDM systems uh, was very stable um, the interoperability between um, the Cisco router and the DVM systems of Hu Huawei uh, could be um, worked out. We had there, uh, since this was a very early field test, uh, like uh, Robert mentioned, um, equipment which were pro uh, produced before the ratification of the 802.3BA. Um, 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 product uh, um, statement uh, of this definition um, and um, we saw that uh, we had a quite successful test bed and uh, that we can say that this technique can be deployed or is ready to be deployed in a production environment. This were Again, the test partner or the partner collaborating in this test. This is on one hand DFN, uh, then we had our colleagues from Jülich. Um, we had um, Cisco and Gasline and Huawei as the uh, commercial partners involved in, in the test environment. Thank you. Thank you, Robert and uh, Bruno. Very interesting. Any question from the audience? Yeah. Hello, my name is uh, Lars Langebjörn from Nordnet. I would like to hear if you can elaborate on the issues that you had with the CFP. I've recently myself experienced some problem with uh, lane markers on lane uh, LR10, which is not a ITU standard, but. Can you explain what you saw with the with the mix of vendor of CFP? Uh, we, we saw since this were uh, CFPs which were pro produced before the ratification of the standard that they would not talk to each other via the optical inter via the optical interface. They would not recognize their light. Could could you see exactly what the problem was? Is, is it ro uh, uh, change of wavelength, or, or was it the lane marker and the gearbox behind, or? No, no, we didn't. We we didn't. Yes, it works. Can you hear me? No. Yes. Okay. Uh, wh what we have done, we have looked in the in the CLI outputs of the TISC operating system, which provided a quite amount of data, the show control output, and what we have seen here, we we at one CFP, we have seen on the on the electrical interface of the CFP, so on the ten. 10 lines of 10 gig Ethernet interfaces there is for each of these interfaces bit error counters. And we saw on that electrical interface on the CFP which which, tra which transmitted the traffic, bit errors increasing. And on the other end, in, th in, the, in the other side at, at the receiving router, we have seen CRC errors which were correlate, which we could correlate with the bit error counters on the transmitting CFP. Okay. So we, we were sure at the end that this CFP, which was also the oldest one, has has a reason was a reason of this of this problem. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. More questions from the audience? <coughs> I have one more then. Uh, I saw that you, you have done this all on a on a dedicated fiber, right? If I understood it correctly. Yes. So now, from your last slide, you said tested. Cool. Okay. Is it in production now? <laughs> it is not in production yet. Have you rolled it out in your uh, production <laughs> network? But we, we have these gas line fibers, which are quite 
really the same in, in our XWIN implemented already, but not this one at GIG, but uh, they, we have running it in our network, these fibers, and this was the first time the field test that we have put that testbed into operation for just see if 100 gig works in our production fiber environment. And on these, uh, on the fiber were two, uh, two modulations. One was the 100 GE connection between the two ends and the other was uh, 40 G. Mm -hmm. And they were running at the same time. Okay, well, thank you Bruno, thank you Robert, and thanks everybody for attending uh, this session. Before you leave, please remember, tonight we go to the gala dinner with the old trams. Free beer is provided on the trams. However, the trams are on the, they are, they are on the traffic, so they won't wait. So please at 6.45 be in the hotel lobby, so the, the ladies will get you to the tram stop, and there the trams will come, and free beer on the train. Thank you. Bye.